Good morning, Christ Community Church. And uh, happy Thanksgiving. I am thankful for you guys. And I'm thankful for God's word. And I'm thankful for the job I get to do of bringing the two together. So uh, thanks for coming today to in-person worship the Lord Jesus Christ, listen to his word. Those of you who are joining us at other campuses or online, welcome to you as well. Let's pray and ask God to teach us from his word what he brought us here to hear from him today. Would you pray with me? Uh, God, each of us, we quiet our hearts before you right now. We ask that you still our minds, God, remove the distractions and help us to hear your voice. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, about a month or so ago, I was having breakfast with a buddy at a local restaurant, and we, you know, we finished our breakfast, and we hadn't quite finished our conversation, so we, we took it outside. We were standing on the sidewalk uh, outside the restaurant. Next door, there was a, a store. We were standing there talking, and my buddy pointed to my car in the parking lot there. He says, oh, you got a new bike rack. I said, yeah. He said, did you get new bikes to go with it? I said, well, as a matter of fact, we traded in our 15 to 20-year-old bikes, and we did. We got new bikes. And he said, oh, electric bikes. I said, excuse me, electric? No, we got real bikes. We got the kind that you got to pump, you know, you got to to work them. And then I proceeded to tell him why I thought electric bikes are a bad idea and, uh, and why Sue and I would never cave in, we'll never buy an electric bike. And and I, I, you know, I went on and on dissing electric bikes. Well, it so happened the store was standing outside the front of it. It was a nice fall day. The door was open. Someone on the inside heard our conversation going on. So he came out. Now, he happened to be the owner of the store, and it happened to be an electric bike shop. <laughs> Honest to goodness, I'm not making this up. And he jumped right into the conversation and he corrected my uh, misconceptions about electric bikes and he extolled the virtues of electric bikes. And, uh, you know, even though I told him I was sick and tired of little old ladies flying past me on the bike path without <laughs> breaking a sweat, yeah. And he said, you know, this, this could be your next bike. And I reminded him I just bought two new bikes, okay? I won't need anything for a while. And he said, yeah, when you come around, You'll come visit me, and I'll let you move up in the world. (laughs) So I go home, and I'm recapping this to Sue. And I said, you know, the guy really impressed me on a couple of scores. First of all, he is so passionate about electric bikes. And secondly, he's passionate enough to jump into a conversation about the topic with somebody he's never met before. And that got me thinking... Am I as passionate about Jesus Christ as this dude is about electric bikes? And, and am I passionate enough to engage people in conversation about Jesus? And that's our topic today. That's our, our topic. I want you to turn with me. We're going to be, be talking about gospel courage, okay? So turn with me to Acts chapter 4. You'll find it in your New Testament. And if you uh, didn't bring a Bible, but you can find it on an electronic app, you'll want to follow along. We are in the second week of a three-part series called Disciples Reach, meaning disciples of Jesus reach out with the good news. They share the good news of Christ with others. Now, this fits with our mission statement as a church. This is a critical component of the mission statement. I put it on the screen. I asked you last week to read it with me. I'm going to ask you to do it again. So enthusiastically, here we go. Our goal is to make passionate disciples of Jesus Christ who are belonging, growing, serving, and reaching. So our goal is to make passionate disciples of Jesus Christ. The question is, how would we know, how would we know if we've accomplished our mission? And the answer is, we would have a church, five campuses worth, full of people who are belonging, growing, serving, and reaching. And we consider these four marks of a disciple to be so important that we decided this ministry season, we would do four series of three weeks, three or four weeks apiece on each of these marks of a disciple. So back in September, we did a series called Disciples Serve on the serving mark. And today we're in the second week of a three-part series called Disciples Reach. Genuine followers of Jesus reach out to others with the good news about Jesus. And that requires gospel courage. Now, it requires more than courage, 
You know, it, it requires that you know something about the content of the gospel. What is the good news that you're supposed to share with others? It, it requires that you actually love people enough to engage in these conversations, that you, you love your coworkers, you love the people you go to school with, you love your neighbors, extended family members. It assumes you have some basic uh, conversational skills, you know, how to start a conversation, move it in the direction of spiritual things, how to ask good questions. But above all, it requires courage, courage to engage others in Jesus, uh, Jesus conversations. You know, if we lack courage, if we lack boldness, if we la lack a willingness to take a conversational risk, we will never open our mouths. And so, so today we're going to take a look at the gospel courage of two of Jesus' earliest followers. Now, let me give you some backstory to what we're about to read in Acts chapter 4. Peter and John, two of Jesus' disciples, this event takes place some weeks after Jesus has been crucified, resurrected, returned to heaven. Peter and John are on their way to the temple one afternoon at three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, because even though they're Jesus followers, they're still pious Jews and 3 p.m. is prayer meeting time at the temple. So they're on their way to a prayer meeting. And outside the temple gate, there is this lame dude who's been lame since birth. And this is a really strategic place to put yourself if you're going to beg, which is what he was doing, because pious Jews believed that almsgiving, charity, was part of their religion. So they're right outside the gate of the temple as people arrive for prayer meeting. Peter looks at this guy and he says, you know... Silver and gold, I, I, don't, I don't have, but what I do have, I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And this lame man, lame since birth, stands to his feet. Scripture says he jumps around, did cartwheels, three backflips. That's not in the Bible. I just wanted to see if you're still, you know, how far I could take you on that one. But it does say he jumped around. He was jumping around, and a crowd gathered. And Peter took advantage of the crowd to talk to them about Jesus. Now, unfortunately, this created a problem because just weeks earlier, Jesus had been crucified in this very vicinity and the religious leaders thought we finally got rid of that troublemaker. You know, Jesus, they saw Jesus as an agitator and now all of a sudden, here are two of his followers and they're stirring the pot again. So the religious leaders, they're part of a group called the Sanhedrin, that is the, the, the ruling council of religious leaders. They send temple guards to arrest Peter and John, haul them to jail, and the next day, Peter and John are brought to face their religious interrogators. And that's where we pick up the story in verse 8 of Acts chapter 4. Follow along as I read. And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame, and we're being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. And salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to man mankind by which we must be saved. And when they saw the courage, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So where do you get the courage to talk about Jesus? Where does gospel courage come from? We're going we're gonna to note five takeaways from this story, from the lives of Peter and John. Where does gospel courage come from? Okay, number one, you got to stay connected to Jesus. You got to stay connected to Jesus. So what is it? What is it that these, these religious leaders were so astonished by? Look, look, look again at verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they're unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. They were astonished 
at the courage of these unschooled men. Now, you need to understand, the word unschooled here doesn't mean they were illiterate, that they were uneducated, they were country bumpkins. No, unschooled means they they had not had theological training. They'd not gone to seminary. They weren't rabbis. And yet, here they were. I mean, they were ex-fishermen, and they're standing in front of the ruling council of religious leaders with such boldness, totally unintimidated. And what's the conclusion of these leaders? Where does this courage come from? They conclude, end of verse 13, they must have been with Jesus. See, these same rulers, they had interrogated Jesus weeks before, and they had seen the courage of Jesus. And oh my goodness, now it's, we're seeing it in these two guys. And they conclude they must have been hanging out with Jesus. Jesus must have rubbed off on them. So where does gospel courage come, come from? It comes from hanging out with Jesus. You know, it's interesting to note when, when Jesus called 12 individuals to be his closest followers, his disciples, he gave them a two-part job description. You could read this in Mark chapter 3, verse 14, where it says, Jesus appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. So the two parts of their job description, guys, part one is hang with me, and part two is go tell others about me. So if we're not spending time with Jesus, there's no way we're going to have the courage to tell others about Jesus. And spending time with Jesus, it it doesn't begin, friend, until you surrender your life to Jesus. Have you ever done that? You know, the Bible says that Jesus died on the cross to take the penalty for your wrongdoings, your sins. Jesus is Savior. Have you ever surrendered to Jesus as Savior? The Bible says that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. He was raised to the right hand of God, the Father Almighty in heaven. So that makes Jesus king. Have you ever surrendered to Jesus as king? See, if you have no desire, if you have no desire to engage other people in conversations about Jesus, it may be, listen, it may be because you've not yet surrendered to Jesus as Savior and King. Let let, let me use a little analogy here that I think may help you understand what I'm saying. Suppose you're a friend of mine and I text you pictures of my grandkids uh, because they are so adorable and wonderful and funny and amazing. Yeah, those are the ones that dared to move to Australia. Can you believe that? Ah, wow. But let's say that you, you text those same pictures to a friend of yours. Is that ever going to happen? You going to do that? No, why not? Because they're not your grandkids. They're my grandkids. In fact, it it would be pretty weird if you text (laughs) pictures of my grandkids to somebody else, right? If Jesus is not yet your savior and king, it's highly unlikely that you're going to be inclined to talk him up with friends or neighbors or coworkers or school buddies. Now, this may be a critical moment of self-diagnosis. Please listen. Take an honest look at your life. Are you eager? I'm not saying are you bold yet, because that's our topic today, but but just is there a, a willingness, an eagerness to share Jesus with others? Because if not, it's probably due to the fact that he's not yet your savior and king. And that's a big deal. That's, you know, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm drilling down in, into this, friend, is because it means you're missing out on what Jesus has to offer in the here and now. He talks about giving us abundant, purpose-filled, God-connected life, and you're missing it. And it means you're going to miss out on the eternal life that Jesus promises in the world to come if you've not surrendered to Jesus as Savior and King. This is why I want it for you. And, and, and by the way, we talked about this last weekend in a sermon called Why Jesus? So why does all this got to revolve around Jesus? If you missed that, I encourage you to go to our website, listen to that. You owe it to yourself to understand what's at stake here. You know, Jesus himself said, you know, back to our theme of courage, you know, where does the courage come from to talk about, about Jesus? It comes from hanging out with Jesus, begins when you surrender your life to him, but it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. You know, this is only the beginning. Jesus himself said that if we want to bear fruit, 
If we, if we want to see our relationship with Jesus reproduced in other people, we want to see other people get it, then we got to hang out with Jesus. Here's how Jesus puts it in John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. Jesus says, No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You know, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me, if you stay connected to me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. It's a great scripture. You know, somebody ought to get it tattooed on his arm. So, <laughs> yeah. Fruitful conversations with Jesus only happen if you stay connected to Jesus. So the big question is, how do we stay connected to Jesus? Well, one of the ways you do it is by doing what you're doing right now. You know, once a week you carve out time and you don't miss it. You get together with other Jesus lovers and you worship him and you listen to his word taught and you, you bump elbows with people who are faithful followers of his. That's one of the ways to stay connected. But what do you do between the weekends? You know, are you spending daily time in, in God's word? That's how you stay connected. Jesus says, if I remain, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you're going to bear much fruit. You know, another way we stay connected is when we get together midweek with a group of friends and we, you know, we call them community groups around here. And you read the Bible, you study it together and you talk about it and you apply it to your life. You know, you stay connected to Jesus when through the course of a day you find yourself doing something wrong, something you know God says don't do, it's sin, and you confess it and you say, oh God, just forgive me. And there's an immediate restoration of that connectedness. You, you connect with Jesus when in the strength and with the gifts that he's given you, you find an area to serve and you serve him and now you're working in partnership with Jesus. See, if you're not practicing daily spiritual disciplines like the ones I've just described, you're not staying connected to Jesus and so you won't be ready when opportunities spontaneously pop up to talk about him. Okay, true confession this is the number one reason why I sometimes miss potential Jesus conversations. I'm just not ready. You know, I'm not walking closely with Jesus in the moment, and so when the opportunity pops up, I'm just not inclined to talk about him. You know, but afterwards, afterwards, I'm kicking myself. <laughs> You know, afterwards I'm saying, oh gosh, when they shared that difficulty in their life, it would have been so natural to say, hey, I'm a prayer. Can I take a minute just to pray for you? Or it would have been so natural in that last conversation to say, hey, I know you like music. We got this kicking musical artist named Blessing Offer. He was on The Voice and whatever. He's coming to Christ Community Church. You want to come with me? It would have been so easy while they were describing to me the tension in their marriage to say, Hey, I have seen Jesus restore other relationships, and I know he could do that for you too, but I missed the opportunity. I could have, could have, could have, could have talked about Jesus, but my lack of connection with him at the time undermined my gospel courage, so I didn't say anything. Stay connected to Jesus. You get it? Good. Here's the second lesson we learned from Peter and John. Create open doors. Create open doors. Go back to uh, Acts chapter 4. The religious leaders have arrested Peter and John for healing a lame man, and they throw him in jail, and the next day they haul him out, and Peter and John are now standing in front of them. We're picking it up at verse 14 where we left it off. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from, from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are, what are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they've performed a notable sign and we can't deny it. Okay, so what had given Peter and John the opportunity to talk about Jesus? A notable sign. Okay, a miraculous good deal. A lame man who had been healed. Now, here's the cool part, friends. Good deeds don't have to be miraculous. They could just be normal acts of kindness. They, they, they could just be normal acts of generosity on our part. But when, when we engage in, in good deeds, it causes people 
to see God in us. They wonder, well, what's behind this? And it opens the door, creates an open door to talk about Jesus. You know, Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 16, he said, let your light shine before others so they'll see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, now here's the tricky part of this. When, when you do an act of kindness, uh, act of generosity, and someone says, wow, you're so cool, thank you, and they give you kudos, you don't sit there with a smug look on your face like, yes, I am wonderful, aren't I? You give credit where credit is due. So open doors create an opportunity to say, hey, this came from God. So you don't steal his glory. He deserves the credit. And secondly, you jump through an open door. Around Christ Community Church, we have a saying. The saying is good deeds create goodwill, which in turn opens the door to the good news. You could share the good news. So good deeds create goodwill. And now people are willing to listen to your, your good news. Now, good deeds, they're not the only door openers to conversations about Jesus. There are other ways that we can create open doors. Maybe it's by extending a warm welcome to a new neighbor on the block. You have someone move in recently, walk down a plate of cookies. Or maybe it's offering to pray for someone who has just shared some personal difficulty with you. Uh, Maybe it's adding captions to the pictures that you post on Facebook or Instagram the point to God. You know, some of you are really clever with your captions. Have you thought about how can I be clever in a way that points to God? Or, or, you know, maybe you have a blog. I've got a friend who's a business owner. He writes a leadership blog. Great information for those who are leading organizations, but every once in a while, he works in his relationship with Jesus, finds a way to express it. Open doors. When you see an open door, it stimulates courage. It gives you a sense that, oh, this open door means God is in the works. He's up to something. He's inviting me to partner with him. In Colossians 4, verse 2, the apostle Paul asks these fellow believers to pray for him. He says, pray that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. So God is the one who opens the door to conversations about Jesus. However, we can can partner with them in the creation of these open doors. Recently came across an article in a a Christian news magazine about a young woman named Lydia. Uh, Lydia was the valedictorian of her high school class this uh, last spring. She's a Christ follower. And so she gave her graduation address to thousands of students and parents and teachers And she immediately got everybody's attention by saying, the day before my junior year of high school, my mother took her life by suicide. Everybody's listening now. And Lydia continued. She said, when tragedy struck my life, it was not my grades nor my accomplishments that helped me navigate through that loss. When everything else in my life felt uncertain, the only person I could depend on to stay the same was Jesus. And she said that, and the crowd erupted in applause, and the speech went viral. So people all over the world have heard about this Gen Z girl's Jesus. See, Lydia saw her graduation speech. This is an open door. And when she saw the open door, it gave her courage to talk about Jesus. By the way, next week, Pastor Clayton's going to wrap up this series, and he's going to have just a ton more uh, practical information. How do you get into these kinds of conversations and and, and so on? And we're also posting over the next month, take a look at our website. We're going to have two webinars available, just short webinars, just some insights about how do you get a spiritual conversation going, or how do you invite somebody to church? We've got all this stuff going on in December. We've got baptisms where outsiders come in. We've, we've got blessing offer coming for inspiring stories. We've got Christmas Eve services. But how do you get an invitation across in a winsome way? So webinars available. Here's a third takeaway from Peter and John. Obey God immediately. Obey God immediately. Okay, back to Acts chapter 4. The religious leaders have asked Peter and John to leave the courtroom, so to speak. You know, they're going to decide what to do with them. And this is where we pick up the story, verse 18. Uh, Then they called them in again 
and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, hmm, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You you be the judges. (laughs) I love it. I love it. These two dudes, they're they're getting bolder and bolder by the, the, the minute. What is feeding their courage at this point in the story? It's their determination to obey God rather than people. So what had God told them to do? Well, they could well remember Jesus' final commands to his followers just before he left planet Earth and returned to heaven. The Son of God said to them, I've got all authority to give you this command. Matthew 28, verse 19, I want you to go into all the world and make followers for me. I want you to spread the good news concerning me. I want you to implore people to surrender their lives to me. I want you to baptize them so they'll go public with their allegiance to me. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go, go, you do this. By the way, we've got a baptism coming up in just a couple of weeks, two, three weeks out. If you've surrendered your life to Jesus and you've never gone public, what are you waiting for? This is a party around Christ Community Church. And if, if you've never been at a baptism service around here, it is a joyful event. We have a one hour In fact, I I don't even think it's an hour-long orientation class that will help you understand what it's all about. So go online, check it out, decide that you're going to get baptized coming up. So Jesus says, go, make disciples, go do it. The religious leaders, they tell Peter and John, stop it. Peter and John say, you know, this is not a difficult decision for us. (laughs) See, we can obey God or we can obey you, but we can't obey both, so we'll go with God. Listen, friends, you, you, you and I, we're not going to get hauled into court for talking to people about Jesus. Not yet, anyway. Yeah. We probably won't even be told by anybody explicitly, hey, shut up about Jesus. But in today's increasingly anti-Christian culture, and it is increasingly anti-Christian, shut up is often implied. Keep your Jesus to yourself. So who are we going to obey? If you're a Jesus follower, Jesus, who told you to spread the the good word concerning him, or, or people who are trying to intimidate you, either derisively or maybe politely, to stay silent. You know, I, I read a book not too long ago. I've recommended it once already. Uh, and some of our, our community groups have used it as a study guide. It's, it, it, it's called the 10-second rule. And the premise of the 10-second rule is this. When God prompts you to do something, you ever felt that? Like God is, I think God wants me to do this. You got about 10 seconds to obey. Because if you don't obey within 10 seconds, you will talk yourself out of obeying. Okay, you will find some good reason not to obey. This is especially true when you feel God prompting you like, oh, I could work Jesus into this conversation. You got 10 seconds to either do it or <laughs> you'll wimp out. So a friend of mine, she wrestled with this recently. I'm going to call her X. Her name isn't X. But she said I could use this illustration if it remained anonymous. So she's X, all right? X went to Israel with me and a group from Christ Community Church back in spring. And uh, one of the places we always take people when we go to Israel, we take them to the valley where the Israelites, hundreds of years ago, fought the Philistines. And there was a young Israelite teenager by the name of David who decided to go toe-to-toe with the ginormous enemy warrior Goliath. True story. David took him on with a slingshot and a stone, and he won. So while we're telling the story in in Israel, I I say to people, hey, right now, if you would, just look around, pick up a few stones, put them in your pocket, take them back to the States with you, and when you run into somebody who's facing a ginormous problem in their life, give them the stone and say to them, you know, here's what happened between David and Goliath, and then offer to pray for them. Can I pray for you in this Goliath that you're facing? And it might, just, it might just open up a conversation about Jesus. So X takes this, her stones home, and they, you know, 
They sit around for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, actually. She hasn't done anything with the stones. And then one day, she's a manager, and she's got the unenviable task of having to let somebody go. So she lets Y go, okay? And after she lets Y go, she feels a prompting from God. She ought to ask Y, who she knows is deeply upset, would you like to do coffee? And immediately she thinks to herself, are you crazy? You know, right now, this person who I've just let go, I'm going to ask her, hey, you want to do coffee? So Y says, yeah, sure. And X goes to the coffee with a stone in her purse. And in the middle of the conversation, she feels that urge from God. Give her the stone. Tell her the story. She's got 10 seconds to obey. She pulls out the stone and she gives her the stone and she tells her the story and she says, wow, you got a Goliath face in you. Can I pray for you? And why bursts into tears? And she says, none of my religious upbringing has given me any hope, the kind of hope I sense you have in a relationship with Jesus. And the conversation takes off from there. The 10 second rule you got about 10 seconds to obey God rather than that inner impulse that says, ah, no, don't, don't, stay, don't say anything right now. You want to see your gospel courage surge? Then obey God immediately. Number four, drop in Jesus' name. Drop in Jesus' name. Now, don't forget how this story began. Okay, Peter and John arrive at the temple for prayer time. A lame beggar asks them for money. Go back to Acts. But go to a chapter earlier, chapter 3, okay? Acts chapter 3, drop down to verse 6. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. And the lame man was healed. See, there's power in the name of Jesus. And, And that's why Peter continued to drop Jesus' name into his conversation with the crowd. Go a little further in chapter 3, drop down to verse 13. Peter says, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant, Jesus. He's talking to the crowd now. Jesus. Verse 16, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It's Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. And then this same pattern of referring to Jesus by name continues as Peter and John are hauled before the religious leaders. Chapter 4, turn over one page, look at verse 10. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Drop down two verses is verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Let me make a really obvious application here, friends. When we want to steer a conversation in the direction of Jesus, it's really important that we say, Jesus, (laughs) yeah, that we actually use the name. Be a name dropper. Don't just settle for talking about God generically or talking about prayer, or talking about faith, or talking about what a cool church with a really cool pastor you go to, you know. Uh, That may be the way to open a conversation, but you want to get around to Jesus. And I guarantee the more frequently you use the name, the bolder you'll become. You know, I, I, I was thinking as I put this together, Strange thought popped into my head. I remembered an advertisement I saw as a kid. Some of you are old enough to remember this TV commercial. It it was actually one of the longest running commercials in TV ad history. Found that by Googling it. Uh, It's an Oscar Mayer Wiener commercial, okay? Uh, Baloney, actually, is what they they were promoting. And there's this little kid, and he's singing a jingle. Some of you remember this jingle. He says, my baloney has a first name. It's O-S-C-A-R. My baloney has a second name. It's M-E-Y-E-R. And some of you are saying it out loud. That's scary. Yeah? But it sticks in your head, doesn't it? Our Savior has a name. It's J-E-S-U-S. Our King has a name. It's J-E-S-U-S. So use the name. Drop it into conversations. Your courage will increase. And conversely, I'm finding out 
You know, I'm becoming more and more conscious of those times when, when I was out. When I'm in a conversation and it's even drifted to spiritual things, but I failed to mention Jesus, Jesus. A few months ago, uh, Sue and I were up in Door County for our, our summer break. Uh, every summer when we go to study, we spend at least two, two weeks up in Door County get a ton of work done up there because we, we start the day, each of us goes on our own individual uh, prayer walk. Backcountry roads, real peaceful. You kind of connect with God, go four or five miles, come back, sit at your laptop all day. End of the day, we jump on our bikes and hit it hard. So I'm on my prayer walk one, one morning and I come across this guy who's lost. And he asks me in a, a thick accent, he, he says, do you know where such and such a street is? And I did, because I was familiar with the area, having walked it a lot. And then I said to him, I said, hey, your accent, it, it, is it Russian? And he goes, no, I'm from Slovakia. And I said, oh, Slovakia. I said, I've been to Czech Republic several times. And on one of those occasions, I took a car and I drove over to Slovakia. I've been to your, you know, your home country. And he lights up and he said, what were you doing in the Czech Republic? Now, this is what I could have said. <laughs> I could have said, well, we're there as a church. We do these English camps for students who want to learn conversational English every summer, and it gives us an opportunity to talk about Jesus. I could have said that. What, what I said was, well, what was I doing in Czech? Oh, just loving on people. And then I added, I added, oh, we work with an organization there that is helping to resettle Ukrainian refugees. Have a good walk. Those were true statements. We were loving on people. We're helping resettle Ukrainian refugees over there. But it wasn't the truth that this guy needed. He needed the truth about Jesus. You know, we can't talk about Jesus without using his name. So let's look for ways to drop Jesus into our conversation. I guarantee the first time or two you do this, maybe the first 10 times you do this, it's going to feel awkward. But as you do it more and more, your, your boldness is going to grow by leaps and bounds. Here's a, here's a fifth takeaway from Peter and John. And I, I only have the time to mention this. Because this is a long story and there was no way I was going to get through five points. So I'll just tell you what the last point is. It's pray for boldness. So, so here's what happens. The religious leaders tell Peter and John, they give them a slap on the wrist and they say, now, no more talking about Jesus, guys. And they let them go. And Peter and John go back to their Jesus-loving friends and they recap what's happened. And their friends say, let's pray. And they pray, and you, you got to read the prayer sometime for yourself in chapter 4. Because if you want to know how to pray for courage and boldness, this is the prayer. And as you look at it, you'll see why a prayer like this would give you boldness and courage. But drop down to verse 29. This is the close of their prayer. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great, say it with me, boldness. Go to the very last verse, verse 31. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Where does gospel courage come from? If you're a Jesus follower, if there's a genuine desire, I want to talk about Jesus, I just don't have the courage to do it. Okay, hang out with Jesus. Stay connected to him. In those spontaneous moments, you'll start taking advantage of them. Create open doors. And when you see an open door, you can be assured God's at work in this situation. Okay, so obey God immediately. You're getting the urge. Just do it. Throw your hat over the fence and see where it goes. Sometimes it goes nowhere, but other times it's like, whoa, this was a God thing. Drop in Jesus' name. Find a way to refer to Jesus. And before and during and after the conversation, pray. Pray like crazy. God, give me an open mouth. Give me boldness. Let's do that right now. Let's pray, okay? And as we're bowed before God, let me first address those of you who you're saying, wow, this message was not for me because I feel no compulsion, no urge to talk about Jesus. Well, then again, do the self-diagnosis. What does that say? 
it probably says Jesus is not yet your savior and king. See, that's why the the urge is not there. I'm not talking about boldness now. I'm just talking basic desire. And you're missing out on your uh, savior and king, friend. You're missing out on the life that he could give you in this world and the eternal life in the world to come. And I would say right now, if you realize, I don't have a desire to talk about Jesus because I'm not connected with Jesus yet. This is the moment of connection. Just say, Jesus, I want you in my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for offering me forgiveness. I receive that gift right now. Thank you for rising from the dead, being seated on the throne of heaven. I want you to be my king. I want you to rule over my life. You could do that right now. You could connect with Jesus. Would you do it? And those of you who you've got this desire But you you can't look back on a week or six months or a couple of years where you've actually had a conversation about Jesus. You've wanted to, but the boldness hasn't been there. Now take this message and apply it this week. Begin to pray now, God, open my mouth to say something. Even an invite to a blessing offer or saying, hey, I know this is a long time in the future, but Christmas Eve's coming up. You want to you go to a Christmas Eve service with us? God, I, just, I pray that we would release from our five campuses today thousands of people who are really stoked about sharing the good news of Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen.